What drives a human being to murder again and again? What does senseless violence really say about a madman's sense of logic that actually does have a compelling story somewhere in there? Today, we'll take you through a historical gallery of horror, along with the usual suspects of unusual crime. If you're ready, then welcome back. My name is Matt, and today, we are taking a look at five of the deadliest and most depraved serial killers across the United States. Number 1. Dean Coral, the Candyman Dean Coral was born on December 24, 1939 in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He was reportedly a loner growing up and was often trapped in conflict between two hostile parents who later went through a contentious divorce. After many years of working hard in the family business, which was a candy company, and including his years in the military, where he first realized his own homosexual orientation, Coral's sense of personal relationships grew darker and more disturbed. Between 1970 to 1973, Dean Coral killed a minimum of 28 victims which is, to this day, suspected to be a conservative estimate. It is possible that all the bodies could not be found, but according to the available evidence, all of his victims were males aged 13 to 20, the majority of them in their mid-teens. Most of the victims were abducted from Houston Heights, which was then a low-income neighborhood northwest of downtown Houston. With most abductions, he was assisted by one or both of his teenage accomplices, David Owen Brooks and Elmer Wayne Henley. Several victims were friends of one or both of Coral's accomplices. Others were individuals with whom Coral had himself become acquainted to prior to their abduction and murder. And two other victims, Billy Balch and Gregory Malley Winkle, were former employees of the Coral Candy Company. Coral's victims were usually lured into either one of the two vehicles that he owned, a Ford Econoline van or a 1969 Chevrolet Corvette that he is known to have purchased. The enticement was usually an offer of a party or a lift, and the victim would be driven to Coral's house. Once there, the youths would be given alcohol or other drugs until they passed out tricked into donning handcuffs or simply grabbed by force. They were then stripped naked and tied to either Coral's bed or usually a plywood torture board which was regularly hung on a wall. Once manacled, the victims would be sexually assaulted, beaten, tortured, and sometimes after several days, killed by strangulation or shooting with a 22 caliber pistol. Their bodies were then tied in plastic sheeting and buried in discreet locations nearby. In several instances, Coral forced his victims to either phone or write to their parents with explanations for their absence in an effort to soothe any of the parents' fears for their son's safety. He is also known to have retained keepsakes, usually keys, from his victims. He was often referred to as the Candyman or the Pied Piper due to his connection to his family firm, the Coral Candy Company. He was said to have had a habit of handing out free candy to kids, and later on this turned out to be horrifyingly similar to his habit of enticing young men with special treats to trust him, right up to the point where they were captured, tortured, and murdered by the Candyman. Dean Coral died in 1973 after a violent dispute and shooting incident after bleeding out from gunshot wounds inflicted by one of his own accomplices, Elmer Wayne Henley. In his case, there were no legal proceedings since his case was discovered post-mortem. All of the details in the police records were revealed by Henley, other accomplices, and the family members of past victims. Coral was so good at concealing his true nature throughout his life that he remains a mysterious figure to this day. Psych Profile Although Dean Coral was never captured alive and never diagnosed with any mental illness or known conditions, 
Some of his actions seem to indicate the characteristics of a dissociative identity disorder. For example, when he was around his family, army friends, or in any other conventional social situation, he appeared normal and well-adjusted, which means he took some effort to conceal the other side of him around them. When he was in his comfort zone, around his right-hand men, meaning his known accomplices and his criminal associates, he could show the crazy and violent side of his personality, and did so frequently, and often enough to disturb even other hardened criminals. The Media A 2003 film named Freak Out was loosely inspired by the Houston mass murders committed by Coral. The film was directed by Brad Jones, who also starred as Coral. This film largely focuses upon the last night of Coral's life prior to Henley shooting him and contacting authorities. Number 2. Richard Ramirez, The Night Stalker Ricardo Richard Leva Munoz Ramirez was born on February 29, 1960 in El Paso, Texas. His father was an abusive alcoholic. His mother and his multiple siblings lived in terror of that abuse and domestic violence, and at an abnormally young age, Richard himself fell under the evil influence of his older cousin, Miguel Mike Ramirez, a decorated combat veteran who nonetheless had an extremely disturbing history as a serial killer and a rapist during his overseas tour of duty in the Vietnam War. Miguel used to show the young Richard Polaroid pictures of the multiple Vietnamese women who were his own targets. These graphic images of war crimes showed the women to be raped, dismembered, and murdered. Richard was fascinated rather than repulsed. Subsequently, his own highly publicized home invasion and murder spree across the greater Los Angeles area and later the San Francisco Bay area over the course of 14 months featured a wide variety of weapons and different murder methods. These included handguns, various types of knives, a machete, a tire iron, and a claw hammer. Richard Ramirez was known to attack by punching, pistol whipping, and strangling many of his victims both manually with his hands and, in one instance, a ligature. He stomped at least one victim to death in her sleep and tortured another victim by shocking her with a live electrical cord. Ramirez apparently enjoyed degrading and humiliating his victims, especially those who survived his attacks or whom he explicitly decided not to kill by forcing them to say that they loved Satan or telling them to swear on Satan if they wanted to live. It was during this period of intense terror that he inflicted on California residential communities that he became known as the Night Stalker in the national press. And on August 30th, 1985, Ramirez was recognized by members of the public as El Matador, or literally the killer, due to his prominence in news media reporting. A crowd of people chased him down in the street near Boyle Heights in L.A. and nearly beat him to death before police arrived. In 1989, Ramirez was convicted of 13 counts of murder, 5 attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries, and sentenced to death in California's gas chamber. After filing multiple appeals, Ramirez was transferred for medical treatment of complications secondary to B-cell lymphoma to Marin General Hospital in Greenbrae, California. He died there in 2013 without ever expressing any remorse for his actions. Psych Profile Psychiatrist Michael H. Stone describes Ramirez as a made psychopath as opposed to a born psychopath. This implies that the abuse and bad experiences he was subjected to at an early age and the unstable way he was raised led him to think that certain actions were normal, as that was the only norm he knew of. However, with the loss of his moral compass, Ramirez began to build up his own desire with the patterns of his killing and this new public spotlight he never had before, as he was being portrayed as a terrifying, anonymous celebrity predator actually encouraged him to execute more people as a means of gaining more attention. Media Richard Ramirez has been portrayed many times in the mass media due to the intensely scrutinized nature of his case. 
There are many movies and documentaries about him, including two depictions of him in the FX anthology series American Horror Story, in the fifth and ninth seasons respectively. Most recently, there was a 2021 documentary released by Netflix called Night Stalker, The Hunt for a Serial Killer, which features first-person interviews, archival footage, newly shot reenactments, and original photography related to the case. H. H. Holmes, The Torture Doctor Herman Webster Mudgett, better known as Dr. Henry Howard Holmes, or H. H. Holmes, was born on May 16, 1861, in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. He came from a modest farming family who were descendants of the original English immigrants to the area, and also happened to be devout Methodists. As a young man, Mudgett trained as a surgeon from the University of Michigan. So how did this man end up becoming known as America's first serial killer? Due to unreliable reporting in an era of great superstition, there was a lot of sensationalization and misinformation about this case for decades. Initially, reports by the Yellow Press, the supermarket tabloids of the time, often emphasized the existence of Holmes's murder castle which was supposed to contain secret torture chambers, trap doors, gas chambers, and a basement crematorium. But all of this was subsequently disproved. Holmes did have a history of selling cadavers to medical schools. However, he acquired his wares through grave robbing rather than murder. Other accounts claim that the building was made up of over a hundred rooms and laid out like a maze, with doors opening into brick walls, windowless rooms, and dead-end staircases. In reality, the hotel floor was moderately sized and largely unremarkable. It did contain some hidden rooms, but they were used for hiding furniture that Holmes bought on credit and did not intend to pay for. The verifiable facts are that Holmes was sentenced to death for only one murder, that of his former accomplice and business partner, Benjamin Peitzel. It is believed that he killed three of Benjamin Peitzel's children, as well as three women he was engaged in sexual relationships with, the child of one of the said mistresses and the sister of another. Unlike most other serial killers, Holmes usually had a rational motive for his series of murders usually for financial reasons or to prevent his own exposure and punishment. The grisly details along the way are what really elevates this case to the top tier of the annals of American horror. He apparently used a range of methods using poison, chloroform, gas, and suspected bludgeoning. He hid the bodies pretty cleverly in cellars and backyards. He constructed elaborate and overly emotional cover stories to dupe his unsuspecting victims. Several of his endeavors were actually financial fraud and misdemeanor crimes, so as a talented con man and grifter, he himself was able to confuse the details of his exact crimes thoroughly. Historians now say that it was his own talent for tall tales, deception, and duplicity that led to his public reputation as America's first serial killer. On the other hand, he really did use some killing methods known only to medical professionals of the time. So the other title of the Torture Doctor is perhaps more appropriate for him. Holmes was executed in 1896. Before he died, he succeeded in thoroughly confusing the police, press, and public with wild and contradictory confessions of his own crimes. In some cases, he confessed to the murder of people who were verifiably still alive. At one point, he claimed to be possessed by Satan, which makes about as much sense as anything else that we know about him. Psych Profile Although this case largely predates the introduction of mental health evaluations into the United States criminal justice system, later generations of psychiatrists believe that Holmes may have been almost entirely unique in that he was psychopathic, extremely intelligent, charismatic enough to fool most others, creative in his various M.O.s, and prolific in his killing strategies. A study from Concordia University, St. Paul, posits that Holmes was a predator who viewed others as a means to his ends. His personality structure resembled that of a true psychopath, a remorseless and narcissistic person who controls others and lies repeatedly, all of this while being glib and charming. 
Media There have been multiple books and depictions of Holmes in popular media across the last century. A few of the most famous are the 2006 episode of the U.S. television drama series Supernatural, where the ghost of H.H. H. Holmes returns to kidnap people. In 2017, the History Channel aired an eight-episode limited docuseries entitled American Ripper, in which Holmes's great-great-grandson, Jeff Mudgett, along with former CIA analyst Amaryllis Fox, investigated Holmes' life to try and prove that Holmes was also the infamous London serial killer, Jack the Ripper. And as of 2019, an adaptation of Holmes' life called The Devil in the White City, with Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio attached as executive producers, was said to be in development with Paramount TV and Hulu. This production appears to be in hiatus for now, but may well be revived later according to industry reports. Number 4. Ed Gein, The Butcher of Plainfield Edward Theodore Gein was born on August 27, 1906 in La Crosse, Wisconsin. His father was an alcoholic and largely unemployed, while his mother was a bitter and bigoted religious fanatic. In between the drinking and the excessive Bible reading, Gein may have ended up with what a child psychiatrist today might call trauma triggers, or PTSD. Later in life, he became obsessed with accounts of cannibals and Nazis in pulp fiction magazines, showing a tendency to enjoy a very specific kind of violence. His heavy emotional attachment to his mother may have badly affected his social development and even caused him to murder his own brother Henry, which was later referred to by his biographers as the Cain and Abel aspect of his case. After his mother's death, his mental instability spiraled. His other crimes included the murder and grave robbing of middle-aged women who resembled his mother as his intention was apparently to create some kind of a woman's suit so he could crawl into the skin of these women and become his own mother resurrected. A police search of his home after his capture, following a particularly brutal murder, that of a neighboring female of around the right age, revealed among other evidence a disturbing diagram of the human adult female as a deceased work in progress. The evidence included whole human bones and fragments, a wastebasket made of human skin, human skin covering several chair seats, skulls on his bedposts, some female skulls with the top sawn off, bowls made from human skulls, a corset made from a female torso, skin from shoulders to waist, leggings made from human leg skin, and masks made from the skin of female heads. Gein apparently made a great deal of headway in constructing either a new woman, Frankenstein assembly style, or reconstructing his dead mother before he was captured. Gein could not stand trial due to his clear mental incompetence and was instead confined to a mental health facility. Later on, he was judged competent to stand trial where he was found guilty of murder, but also pronounced legally insane and consequently remanded to a psychiatric institution. He died at Mendota Mental Health Institute in 1984. Psych Profile Gein was diagnosed as having been a schizophrenic as well as a sexual psychopath. His mental illness stemmed from his love-hate relationship towards women, which later turned into a full-scale psychosis. Gein was a necrophiliac, as body parts excited him sexually, though he denied ever actually having sex with the dead bodies that he murdered or exhumed from graveyards, on the grounds that they smelled too bad. Media Gein is actually the most famous serial killer on this list, though not necessarily under his own name. Due to the very specific and darkly grotesque nature of his crimes, Gein was the inspiration for several fictional serial killers, including Norman Bates, the killer from the movie Psycho by Alfred Hitchcock, Leatherface, a skin-wearing killer from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Jamie Gum, a.k.a. Buffalo Bill, a serial killer in The Silence of the Lambs. Number 5. Eileen Warnos, Monster Eileen Lee Carol Warnos was born February 29, 1956 in Rochester, Michigan. 
Her father was a convicted child molester who later killed himself in prison. Warnos's mother abandoned her and her brother when they were young, leaving them with her parents. Warnos's grandparents and their children. Now, Warnos's grandfather beat her, and her grandmother was an alcoholic. Eileen Warnos became a teenage runaway, a prostitute, pickpocket, and regular thief from pawn shops. Later on as an adult, her record included, among other felonies and misdemeanors, arrests for illegal possession of a firearm, forgery, assault, and robbery. Her associates and law enforcement personnel would often describe her as erratic and easily angered. Her arrest records frequently noted that her attitude was poor. From late 1989 through late 1990, the bodies of seven middle-aged white men were discovered in central Florida. Eileen Warnos had robbed all of the victims before shooting them to death and stealing their cars. Of all the other serial killers on this list, Eileen Warnos is verifiably the most consistent, effective, and deadly killer of the group. As far as we know, she never left any survivors. Her victims were all of the same specific age and ethnic grouping in roughly the same area or highway territory. And the MO or modus operandi that she used was so similar in every case that as of today, Warnos is considered a textbook case of a classic serial killer, repeating her murders with regular and pinpoint accuracy. Her victims included Richard Mallory, who was shot multiple times in the chest. David Spears, who was shot six times in the torso. Charles Karskadin, who was shot nine times in the chest and stomach. Troy Burris, who died of two gunshots to the torso. Charles Dick Humphreys, who suffered multiple gunshots to the head and torso. Walter Antonio, who was shot four times in the back and head. And an interesting side note, the FBI profiler Robert K. Ressler briefly mentioned Eileen Warnos and his autobiographical history of his 20 years with the FBI. Writing in 1992, he said he often does not discuss female serial killers because they tend to kill in sprees instead of in a sequential fashion. He said Warnos was the sole exception known to him at the time. Her methods were successful enough that she might have evaded capture indefinitely if her girlfriend, Tyria Moore, hadn't snitched on Warnos to the FBI to avoid her own criminal charges on complicity in the murders. Eileen Warnos was executed in 2002 in Florida after 12 years of imprisonment on death row. Psych Profile According to the Psychopath Checklist, Warnos was found to have a strongly psychopathic personality with a score of 32. The cutoff score for Psychopath is 30 out of 40 in the United States. Warnos was also diagnosed with other issues in prison, and it was officially determined that she had both borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. Media As America's most famous female serial killer, Warnos is a celebrity in her own right and was intensively discussed and represented in the media. But her biggest moment in the spotlight came when she was portrayed by the South African origin Hollywood star Charlize Theron in the movie Monster, released in 2003. Warnos was reportedly disgusted with what she saw as her exploitation by the media without her permission, though she could hardly claim any copyright violation of her crimes against humanity. Theron, on the other hand, went on to win the Oscar for Best Actress for her stellar performance. So, what do you think about these disturbed, deranged, and dangerous killers? Tell us your thoughts in the comments, and if you have other famous serial killers that you'd like to see featured on this channel, or any details or clues that you think we may have missed, let us know. I mean, we're on these investigations together, you guys, and I guarantee we'll get to the bottom of it. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Until next time, stay safe.